сейчас рассмотрим, мне интересно, слышно ли меня. Раз, два, три.
Я вас вижу. Не-не-не. Но не слышу.
Раз, раз, два. Hallo, hallo. Ja. Hello everybody, again. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk today about two parallel but very well connected topics. I originally mentioned, but that was three months ago, I was going to talk about mostly peptide pharmaceuticals. But the other day there was too much biology, so today I will focus a little bit more on chemistry, on synthetic chemistry. And I will try to explain how my group has been dealing with multi-component reaction to create not also peptide pharmaceuticals, but also heterocyclic compounds, library of heterocyclic compounds for the discovery of anti-cancer properties and so on. Uh, I was also told that there were going to be a students here probably, but I don't see them. Anyway, so I will skip some of the parts. But the, just to mention that the, the first part of the talk is related to the use of combined organocatalytic with multi-component approaches. Okay, and just to remember that there are three band ranges of what we call an anti-selective catalysis, one of them using methyls. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about how to derivatize peptides chemoselectively using transition metal catalysis, but also biocatalysis and the topic that I'm going to refer to today, organocatalysis, that is a very well-known topic, everybody knows what is the, the purpose of this topic, just to mention very brief that these small molecules are capable to catalyze and antioselectively organic processes either by behaving as phase, tra uh, phase uh, transfer catalysts or just by using the power of hydrogen bonding to selectively coordinate or bind one of the substrates and then allowing the, the nucleophilic or the electrophilic uh, attack through one of the, of the two phases. But the most relevant organocatalytics that were used over the last 20 years are these small secondary amines derived from proline. 
And in all these cases, using the enamine chemistry, what is called the enamine, the aminium ion chemistry, or the deenamine chemistry, in all cases, what you see is that one is able or one uses a very bulky group or a hydrogen bonding direct group to block one of the phases and to attack to favor the nucleophilic or the electrophilic attack through the other phase. It's a very simple, very simple, simple process. And the enamine chemistry is based on the on the capacity of the proline derived organocatalyst to form enamines with the carbonyl compounds, those having an alpha carbon that is capable to 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 participate in nucleophilic addition, like uh, aldol reactions and something like that. But in all cases, we know very well that this R used to be a very bulky group that allows the reaction, the nucleophilic attack to the electrophile, but one of the preferred phases, and therefore where we are allowing <coughs> to carry down a symmetric process generating an antiomerically pure or at least an antiomerically enriched compounds, okay? So the enamine chemistry using a small secondary amounts is used for the alpha functionalization of carbonyls, while the other alternative approach, which is the aminium ion activation mode, here we have the functionalization at the beta position of a carbonyl compound, because in this case, what we are allowing is the aminium ion to be formed, and this aminium ion in this case is more electrophilic than the starting alpha beta on saturated aldehyde. So all the catalytic approaches rely on the capacity to enhance the energy of the homo or reduce the energy of the lumo orbitals and those make it more elect nucleophilic or electrophilic respectively. Okay, this is a very simple principle, but I don't think we have to explain it here. This is more for a student. Once we form the aminium ion, again, the nucleophilic conjugate addition could be preferred by one of the preferred phases leading to an asymmetric conjugate addition and the formation of an antiomerically enriched compounds. There is one very specific concept that I'm not going to exploit today, but I want to, to mention it. That is what, what is called the, the combination of aminium and amine activation modes. And this is one case in which one electro, uh, alpha beta saturated aldehyde forms the aminium, then reacts with the nucleophile in an asymmetric a conjugate addition giving rise to the enamine, then, then in the presence of an electrophile, you can actually activate in what is called a one-pot one process. Therefore, this is a multi-component reaction because we are having no, a, a substrate one, two, and three in a one-pot process. We can, a, at the same time, functionalize the alpha and the beta position forming two stereogenic centers. And this is very relevant because I started to work with the combination of organocatalysis with multi-component reactions like 10 years ago when I was visiting a professor in Brazil, and there was a professor there, well, everybody was working with organocatalysis at that time. It's like photocatalysis now, everybody wants to do photocatalysis at that time, everybody wanted to do organocatalysis. But the main problem when using this reaction, and one of the students complained to me, is that everybody was saying, ah, all the heights are very difficult to handle. So all the heights get oxidized very easily, especially the aliphatic ones. So you typically have to derivatize all the heights, reduce it or oxidize it to make a good a chiral HPLC analysis of the components and so on, so on. So it's very difficult to work with this unless was the idea that I said to the student, why don't you use it in a multi-component reaction? Because we know that most multi-component reactions relied on the use of carbonyl components. I will talk about that a little bit. For this scenario, I don't have to explain too much what is a multi-component reaction, but it's very important, and I teach this to students all over the world, to mention that the multi-component reaction has to be a one-pot process, and it has to incorporate substrates from all the three components, at mi minimum three is a minimum, okay? There are a lot of mistakes. We reject, at least I reject a lot of papers in the literature of people claiming that they have developed new multi-component reaction and they are not multi-component. People isolate the intermediate, change the solvent, do intermediate uh, extraction process, and then they claim that they have a domino, new domino multi-component reaction, no. Not at all. A multi-component reaction is a one-pot process in which you mix up everything. They are typically domino 
processes, but not all domino processes are multi-component, of course, because you have to 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 obey the both rules. It has to be one pot, and it has to incorporate into the final structure molecular fragment from all the substrate. This is very relevant to keep on the on the control. I'm going to show procedures which are sequential, but they are not multi-component in some cases because I have to change the solvent or isolate by extraction one catalyst, for example, to avoid the reaction of it. And I, want, I will explain about. These are the names of the most famous one. In blue are those that I'm going to talk about, but there are a lot of them. Every year, two or three new multi-component reactions are described. So it's a, it's a field where a lot of creativity can be, can be placed. And this is, for me, this is the, the favorite uh, multi-component reaction. It's a three-component with a special reactivity of the isocyanide or the isonitrile functional group that for those of you, of you that you know about it, this is a divalent carbon atom. So this is a carbon atom that can react as an electrophile and as a nucleophile at the same time. And this reaction, you mix up everything almost in any solvent, not in polar protic solvent like methanol, but the reaction takes place in water amazingly. And then you find this, uh, you obtain this Depsy peptide with the formation of this alpha siloxy carboxamide. So on. So this is a reaction with 100% atom economy. It produced not even water as a byproduct. It's a spectacular reaction. And it was the first reaction to be described using the isocyanide functional group in 1921. What I'm going to talk today is how is the evolution of multi-component reaction has been taking place using isocyanide uh, functionality and how our group has been contributing to that. Okay, but originally when we started to work, we have like 10 or 15 papers in 2014, 15, using aldehyde, chiral aldehydes for Paserini three-component reaction. So the idea of with that the student was that if we can produce asymmetrically one chiral aldehyde with an enantion rich, then perhaps we can make a, a chiral induction and to make it the diasteroselective Paserini three-component reaction. We got good papers, but not a spectacular paper because this reaction has the problem that is not so diasteroselective as one would expect. Okay. Also, the idea of combining organocatalysis with multi-component reaction was not as new as we expect. Fortunately, nobody had done it before with isocyanide, but there were two groups combining, for example, the manic three-component reaction with organocatalysis. Organocatalysis is a typical manic catalyzed by proline, in which the enamine form allows the, the preferred attack to the to the to the imine, to the chief base, by one of the two phases. And also this is the typically hunch dehydropyridine synthesis in which the iminium ion activation form using the Jorgensen Hagashi catalyst was used to activate the alpha beton saturated aldehyde and to allow the attack of the decarbonyl and the diamine in the hunch three component process in an asymmetric or the asteroselective uh, version in this case, okay? So the full idea was not so new, but we found a niche using isocyanide multi-component reaction, and this is what I want to explain, how we develop new multi-component reactions using the idea of using chiral aldehydes produced by organocatalysis to be substrates of uh, isocyanide-based multi-component reactions, okay? So this is the classic UGI four component reaction, and I'm explaining this Again, to introduce one concept that for me is a very key concept, when everybody looks at, the, at this reaction, it's very similar to the Passerini three-component reaction, just adding one primary amine more, okay? Actually, the mechanism is different, the reactivity is different, the solvent required is different, but Ugi himself, he said in a conference in 2004, one year before he died, that he got empire in the chemistry, in the sh chief chemistry, and the imine chemistry developed in Florence by Hugo Schiff with the chemistry of Mario Passerini also developed also in Florence in the late 19th century by Mario Passerini and described at the beginning of the 20th century in the Passerini three-component reaction. So the UGI four-component chemistry is actually a mixture of the chemistry of these two scientists that was developed in Florence in, in the, at the beginning of the 19th century. A condensation reaction, reaction with the carboxylic acid and the cyanide, forming this dipeptide with one n substituted amide here. Take a look to this structure because I'm going to exploit the pharmacological properties of this 
peptidic structure very much for during my talk. There is one special concept that for heterocycle chemistry is very is key in my opinion, and it's the concept of the single <coughs> single reactant replacement was defined, although everybody had been using it for one century, it was defined by Bruce Gannam in his account of chemical research describing the chemistry of his group. And this is when you have a multi-component reaction with A, B, C, you can replace A by a different functional group or with a functional group having a bifunction, a bifunctionality, a bifunctional character, and then you can produce a different type of heterocyclic or peptidomimetic scaffolds just by replacing one single reactant. This is key because most, I, I would say most, because some of them are really innovative, but everything that the rest of the people have been done is just replacing one reactant by another. And then you get the new reaction, okay? Sometimes there are very few highly, highly new, very, very new multi-component reactions. Most of them are just replacing one thing by the other. But you can publish a lot. You can innovate a lot because you have to know what is the mechanisms of the reaction. You have to know how you can replace one nucleophilic partner by another one with a similar type of reactivity but giving rise to a different type of a scaffold. And this is very relevant for the students starting. For example, the UGI smiles for component reaction. Take a look at this is a reaction with a nitrophenol. So a phenol with a nitro at the ortho or the para position can react, giving rise to these peptidic anilines, this type of a scaffold that is very unique and very difficult to produce by other means. When you compare the UGI smile for component reaction, in all cases, take a look that the imine here gets protonated by the nitrophenol, and as I told you before, the isocyanide with the doppel, with the electrophilic and nucleophilic behavior reacts with both of them, giving rise to this. I will explain the, the mechanisms a little bit later, but I just want to come back to the mechanisms of the UGI to insist on the concept of the of the single reactor replacement. So here the carboxylic acid protonates the chief base to make it more electrophilic and to make it capable to react with the isocyanide. The carboxylate also reacts with the electrophilic orbital of the, of the isocyanide. And then we have these intermediates and the final rearrangement is what is called the MOOM rearrangement. This is very complex to understand, but you have to see that this is a normal intramolecular acylation step. So this is like a mixed anhydride intermediate in which the secondary amine attacks here, rearranging and giving rise to this pep depeptidic structure. So if you modify, if you add something else with a different type of rearrangement, then you can have a new multi-component reaction. And this is what Lorraine Elkain from France, he did. So he realized that the nitrophenol have an acidity good enough to be able to protonate the imine, but also to be able to react as a nucleophilic partner, giving rise to this intermediate. And this rearrangement here is what is called the SMILES rearrangement. There is an S missing here. It's not a smile from a smiling, it's a smile from a surname. So this is a typical nucleophilic aromatic substitution at the ortho position of the nitrophenol. It's a different type of rearrangement. So just by replacing a carboxylic acid by a nitro nitrophenol, you can have a different type of reaction. He got like 20 Angevante papers with this reaction. So it was very <laughs> profitable for him to discover a new reaction with this, okay? Giving rise to this. Very striking for our purpose for our design of, it, of new heterocycle synthesis was the, the report by Oru and Marcos in, two, in 2012 that the heterocyclic enols and the conjugated enols, will, they were also capable to participate in this type of reaction, okay? So this enol, because of the conjugation to the other carbonyl groups, is acidic enough to protonate the imine, but it's also nucleophilic enough to be able to participate in the type of rearrangement that the typical alpha adduct after the addition of the two components to the isocyanide, it has to be an irreversible rearrangement to, to be the driving force of the isocyanide-based multi-component reaction, okay? So based on all, all this that I have been telling for the last 10 minutes, how we focus on the organocatalysis approach for producing an antiomeric enriched aldehyde that could serve as substrates of new multi-component reaction and using based on the capacity of the enols 
to participate in a new type of multi-component reaction. We develop a new, a, a highly stereoselective strategy that is the same one that I'm going the, the following, okay? So this is a, a one-pot approach, although there is a lot of discussion because we have to change the solvent here if it is actually totally multi-component, multi but at the end, this, uh, in any case, this final step is multi-component. So we use this decarbonyl compound with the alpha beta saturated aldehyde using the Jorgensen Hagashi catalyst as before, secondary amine with a very bulky uh, uh, substituents blocking one of the phases and allowing the attack by the by the less hinder, aesthetically hinder phase. So giving rise to these intermediates. What we have here, this is a conjugated enol and this is an aldehyde. Of course, we have a hydroxyl and a carbonyl compound very close. We are forming an emi-acetal in this case. But this is a bifunctional, a chiral, and antiomerically pure bifunctional substrate because it contains in only one component, the carbonyl component with a chiral, with a stereogenic center at the beta position with the capacity to have a chiral induction here. And we have the enol, conjugated enol, with the capacity to participate in, in this newly developed multi-component reaction, okay? When we mix this with the primary amine and any isocyanide, we have to put a little bit of a polar protic solvent because the reaction, this typically oogie type reaction, they don't take place in polar, in polar protic solvents, in, in a polar solvents. They need methanol or, or, or a protic solvent. We obtain this tetrahydroquinolinone, okay, with a very high enantio on the asteroselectivity if we use chiral amines. Take a look here that by using only benzylamine, we get a very good enantiomeric excess, but we got almost one-to-one -one the asteroselectivity. I mean, the chiral induction of this acerogenic center here is not sufficient. We need also to combine the chiral induction provided by the chiral amine. In the case we use a chiral amine, we get only almost one stereoisomer from all of, of the possible stereoisomers. So it's a very highly acero-selective reaction we were able to publish in Angevante in 2015. It was the first example of the combination of organocatalysis with isocyanide type chemistry to produce what we call natural product-like because these heterocycles are very similar to a family of, of anti-cancer alkaloids that is reported in the literature. I'm not going to talk today too much about the biological activity, but we had all the anti-cancer activity of the compounds in follow-up papers and so on, okay? One key suggestion for those of you who work in, hetero in, in heterocycles, because this was said to me by by one of research that I did from Bayer in Germany. So try to get rid of planarity. If you are working with heterocycle seeking biological activity, try to stay away from this because when we, those of us who like heterocycle chemistry, we like a lot of these fuse rings with no stereogenic center. So try to get rid to a full planarity, try to incorporate a, a stereogenic centers into your heterocycles, try to populate also the three-dimensional space and not always stake uh, to the planar heterocycles and you will find better biological activity. At, at least for those trying to do biological study of huge compound libraries, they don't like too much uh, planar compounds. That was 30 years ago. The world has changed now and the pharmaceutical companies are looking for population, for populating the three-dimensional space, of course, in those cases you have to you have to use asymmetric catalysis to obtain. But in and the in the screening process at the beginning, sometimes you don't need even a stereoselective synthesis. Okay, let me come back to the to the mechanisms here. So what we when we mix this with the amine, what is happening here is is forming the shift base that is protonated by the enol, so close that is protonated. This is a hydrogen bond here. Okay, uh, making, we prove this by, by NMR, making a cyclic ring, okay, in which one of the phases is blocked, and then the isocyanate addition, the insertion here, allows forming this intermediate. Take a look that we had to use trifluoroethanol to produce the compound. In the case we use methanol as the co-solvent of dichloromethane, what we obtain, because methanol is nucleophilic, is a nucleophilic addition of methanol to the conjugate position, giving rise to this very interesting compound. We use it a lot 
in peptide chemistry later because it's, it's, it's very useful and it's fluorescent, okay? But the, this is not what we wanted. We wanted to close the, to do the, the annulation reaction, closing the, the nitrogen containing heterocycling, a very good stereoselective reaction. We use peptides, tumors, and structure. So we produce a category of with all natural products like hybrids, they incorporate structure, but doubt is in groups occurring very good and classical found by the screening of we go for the type of cancer We also modify it. At this point, we have to, to diversify the other components. We should open the carbonyl components. We use when we focus in the problem structure, the intercite, the distinct practice, and the isocyanide. We produce this piperidino cumarin hybrids. Take a look with formation of two stereogenic centers. We prove by NMR all the stereochemistry of the reaction. And again, we did it with aliphatic change with peptidic, with sugars. So we proved the scope of the substrate the scope was very broad. We could use a chiral amine like sugar, peptides, a variety of uh, even isocyanopeptides as one of the components, and we produce a library of this. But we also uh, focus on changing the name, of the, the nature of the dicarbonyl component or the nucleophilic component. So this is one case in, one, in which the, the alpha substitute cyanophenone gave rise by the organocatalytic approach to this type of cyclic uh, amiacetal with the formation of one stereogenic center here. So again, this is a conjugated enol here with a, with a carbonyl component with an aldehyde. So by addition of the other two components, we produce these tetrahydropyridines with formation of two new stereogenic centers in a high diastereomeric and an antiomeric excess using a very simple, this is all from five degrees to room temperature, very simple reaction protocols. We use esteroids, again, sugar, peptides, all types of substrates because this is a reaction. And here I have to insist, this is a reaction very mild that we can do in Cuba. In Cuba, we have 19% humidity in winter, okay? With 20 degrees in winter, in summer it's 35. Okay, we cannot run reaction at minus 78 with argon atmosphere. We have to forget about all this fancy chemistry that perhaps you can use here or in New York or whatever. Not in Cuba. This is chemistry done in normal dichloromethane with poral protic solvent. It's a simple normal chemistry. It's just that you have to be innovative in the way that you combine the reactivity of the of the of of and the creativity multi-component reaction to be able to provide new scaffolds. So we did a lot of macrocyclization, a lot of follow-up reaction. We continue publishing on this. I just want to highlight this different example because here we obtain not what we were expecting. So this is an enamine type of activation mode. So this is an, a normal aliphatic aldehyde which forming the enamine is able to do the conjugate addition to the nitroestyrene with the nitro and the phenol group substituted here, providing this intermediate. Actually, this intermediate also occurs as an cyclic uh, amiacetal, okay, because we have a, uh, the, the phenol and the aldehyde, so it's, it's the cyclic form. We see by NMR what we obtain, but this is a bifunctional intermediate that we expected that by reaction with the primary amine was going to give rise to this six-member heterocycle. But no, what we obtained was this one. What we obtained was a penta substituted cyclopentene with five substitution in, all, in, a, in, a, in a one pot reaction. In this case, here we can use methanol, and actually this is not a one pot. So here I want to see we have to use toluene in this solvent, and then we have to concentrate and without any isolation, then uh, put methanol and do the second step. But this, for example, cannot be considered a one-pot reaction. This is a multi-component reaction, but the organocatalysis and the second step is not forming. So this is what is happening. Instead of forming here the six-member ring, because of the attack of the nitrophenol, here we have a second nucleophilic center. So we have the alpha position, the, the, the nitro group, so this nitro 
attacks the nitrillium ion, giving rise to this a cyclopentin a scaffold with the imine, which tautomerizes to form in, to form the enamine. Okay, that's that is the reason why we obtain this type of a scaffold and not the expected six-member heterocyclic rings using. Okay, but in all cases, take a look that either using the minion activation form or the enamine catalysis activation form, what we have is a way to in, to produce substrates which are an antiomerically rich uh, or, or an antiomerically pure because sometimes we have 99% of an antiomeric excess of this component and they can be used as substrates of a new version of a, of its isocyanide based multi-component reaction. We are working now actually with this reaction that was discovered in this country in the 60s. We call it the, well everybody calls it the Povarov reaction. I don't know how the pronunciation is because we the Latin people we we put the accent always at the end in, Fran in French, in Italy, in Spain, we always say it, but I don't know how it's the pronunciation, but it's a spectacular reaction. It is known to be a formal four plus two inverse electron demand the LSAT the reaction. Take a look that this is a reaction of an aniline with an electron withdrawing group in the presence of, a, 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 of an electron rich a alkene and a carbonyl. The carbonyl could be aliphatic, but it's better if it is aromatic, okay? The original article from this are in Russian. Nobody knew about them for 20, for 30 years. And later, the Western world discovered that there was a spectacular reaction, and everybody started to rediscover a reaction that had been discovered in the 60s here in, in this country, okay? This reaction, what is formed here is, again, every time you have an amine and a carbonyl compound, there is an iminion and a chief base form which gets activated by the Lewis acid catalysis because this reaction requires Lewis acid catalysis. And then what we have here is like a manic type reaction. So it's the addition of a double bond, okay, to, a, to, a, to an imine or iminium species giving rise to this intermediate. And this step, what is this? This is a carbocation stabilized by the electron donating group. And this is a typical Friedel-Craft reaction, okay? So what we see as a very complex Former plus far two reaction is a sequence of very simple independent steps. It's a, a imine formation activation by the Lewis acid manic type reaction. Okay, this is a manic type reaction followed by a electrophilic aromatic substitution. That's why the aniline requires the electron donating groups. So if you put a bromine or a nitro, the reaction does not work. Okay, and then you are forming this type of heterocycle. Okay, there are, for example, Angevante papers, as I told you, the reaction was a boom in the, at the beginning of this century because everybody was rediscovering this reaction. There are asymmetric versions. Take a look at this. Is, the reaction works very well with the, the hydropyranes and furanes, okay, giving rise to this variety of fused heterocyclic system, but, as I mentioned before, having three stereogenic center in these cases. What we did, and this is still unpublished, we are still dealing with the publication, again using carbonyl components for doing the organocatalytic conjugate addition either to alpha beton saturated uh, carbonyls or to nitroesterines containing this phenol group here, producing these intermediates, and then we have to do the dehydration, and this is one drawback that I have to mention. We have to do a dehydration here which is not difficult, but not that easy as we expected to obtain the, the piran uh, moiety. And once we have the piran, we, ha we do the power of reaction catalyzed by, by scandium triflate, producing this variety of four different ring fumes in a very complex uh, heterocyclic structure. And it's just a sequence. This is, again, very simple chemistry because when you see it, it's not something fancy to develop. But here, the dehydration is a, is a little bit problematic. Here, it's better than here. We are still assessing what is the actual stereochemistry of the compounds because this reaction could be a concerted reaction or could be actually a, a formal a 4 plus 2 cyclization stepwise mechanisms and not a concerted one. So we are still struggling with the, with the stereochemicals. Okay? So I want to change now the topic a little bit. I don't know if you want to ask something about the stereocyclic part. I'm going to mention now how we use multi-component reaction for peptides therapeutic a little bit.
Ja, de... It's not fine. It's not the, the yield is not good when you are using polyprotect solvent. This is a problem as we wanted to do it in one pot, as I told you before. This is you are absolutely right. This is better in toluene or dichloromethane or ether or whatever THF, but ethanol or methanol is a nightmare. You are absolutely right. We are trying to do it. We are tr we are trying to this scaffold here, we use it for something else. We use it a lot because of what I told you before. We use it in a previous approach, okay? So we were trying to use everything in methanol or or ethanol, but as I mentioned, we are still solving the problems of the, of this reaction because the, the yields are not so good and the stereochemistry is not being analyzed and so on. But you are absolutely right. So try, take a look that we always are a stick to dichloromethane and toluenes in the case. So. Don't pay too much attention to this ethanol here because this is still under optimization. Okay, I just wanted to show you because of the power of reaction. Okay. I I see, but uh, you show here 94 percent in antimeric excess. Um, that means that uh, ethanol not so bad for this yeah, reaction. Yeah, probably methanol uh, ethanol maybe, was not so bad uh, in this case. Yeah. And um, you mentioned in the beginning of your speech, uh, the first one reaction, um, that right. you changed solvent from yeah. uh, had to. dichloromethane to trifluoroethanol. ethanol. You need to add trifluoroethanol. We add trifluoroethanol. We don't change solvent. We had to add the trifluoroethanol. You try to add. Um, so it's a mixture of one, two. The, this reaction take place in a one-to-one -one mixture of dichloromethane and trifluoroethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. Uh, when we put the other two components, we add trifluoroethanol. Mm -hmm. But have you tried first step with trifluoroethanol? Uh, most likely, yes. <laughs> and yeah, didn't work okay. so much, probably. <laughs> okay, thank you. Further questions? Yeah, sometimes it's very easy to say, but sometimes that takes half a year of one student try to optimize the reaction. Okay, we all know that. That's why I don't have to mention every time. But what everybody shows here is half a year of, of optimization, changing condition and reactions and so on. Okay. Thank you so much. So I have one question about uh, catalyst. The mechanism. Catalyst. About your uh, catalyst. catalyst. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this is uh, look like at a chiral auxiliary, you know, chiral auxiliary. As, eh? Sorry, I didn't uh, Chiral auxiliary. Chiral yeah. auxiliary. Yeah. I don't understand. Look like, well. uh, this is like uh, uh, the compounds uh, actually in the third uh, your slide. Can you go back? In the third slide? Yeah, third or fourth slide. Right. That hydrogen bonding catalyst, you can see uh, this look like all uh, chiral auxiliary. So, ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, is there any limitations for uh, this chiral catalyst in, in the reactions? Maybe, for example, if they're having some acid based functional groups and they change the stereochemistry of uh, some groups is there any limitations or we have to take care in, in the reactions yes there, there are a lot of limitations well the first limitation here is the price this is a stupidly expensive mm -hmm. okay uh, probably you know we work just a few with this when we are in germany we do it in cuba we cannot do it we cannot purchase the price of this okay the, the what i can say is when you know a reaction that is catalyzed by a bronze acid then you can use Phosphoric, a chiral phosphoric acid for it. When you know that the reaction is catalyzed by a Lewis acid, then you have ways to go for for a chiral uh, organocatalyst for that or a mimetic or, or that. Okay. Yeah. In our cases, now that you are asking, we are using secondary amines. Yeah. Sometimes secondary amines participate in multi-component reaction. Okay. In this case, we use a five mole percent or ten mole percents. As the Ugi reaction take place at this type of isocyanamic reaction only with the primary amine, we have no problem. But in many cases, when we do it everything in one pot, you can see reaction of the catalyst in your in, in your. It should not be a problem, or it doesn't have to be a problem. 
because everybody says that you can isolate the catalyst by column chromatography and reuse it, but this is a light. So you are using such a small amount and then you can put excess of the isocyanide on the other components. And if something is reacting with this one, it doesn't matter. What you want is to, the, you calculate the yield from your substrate to your main product, okay? But yes, sometimes these secondary amines participate in multi-component reaction. We have a few of them, but we have not, uh, I have not shown here, and we will see reaction of the catalyst. And this is uh, the risk when you are doing all together, you want to do it in one pot to avoid chlorine chromatography in the intermediate or something like that, but then you are having some byproducts in that case, of course. We use this five mol percent, 10 mol percent. It's not a problem for isolation, but you have to know that it could be reacting in your reaction as well. Okay, we have not worked with this one, and we have not worked with this one. So this is a general introduction. We have worked with this one. This has no influence. The phosphoric acid has no influence on the on the Uge reaction. Actually, they enhance the Uge reaction. We we have results on that. They because they protonate the imine to the minium and they make it more electrophilic and better reactants. But we have not worked with these theories from Jorgensen group, and we have not worked with this one. Mostly with all of this, we have worked. So, so we don't use proline because the carboxylic acid reacts in the UG4 component reaction. Right. But we use these two, which in most of the cases we don't have problem with the secondary amines. Okay, yeah. but in some other reactions, yes, <laughs> I have to mention. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. For the questions, not. So let's continue then. So I'm going to jump a little bit to the to peptides, okay, which is actually the 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 main topic of of my group, peptides and proteins and so on. Yesterday I introduced this um, this type of chemistry in which we are able to label a peptide and to modify peptides, to lipidate peptides, to pegylate peptides to biotinylate peptide using the UG4 component reaction and how the power of doing a double functionalization in only one reaction was very important for us, okay? So take a look that we introduce esteroids, fluorescent labels, lipids, biotin, whatever, sugars on the side chains. Take a look at here. This is, again, I am mentioning very easily, but here you have to produce the peptide with an orthogonal protection group because you want to release the peptide only with the carboxylic acid deprotected and non the primary amines because otherwise they could react in the UG4 component reaction. In this case, the same. So you have to protect the carboxylic acid. You have to use a solid phase peptide synthesis. And most of what I'm going to talk about is how we deal with trying to do everything on solid phase. This is, so if one uh, uh, surjection that I do to the people who want to use amino acid and peptide, try to use everything on solid phase, because when you do it in solid phase, you spend a lot of time adapting your solution phase reaction to the solid phase, but once you have it, you do only one purification at the end. You do, do the, all the reaction with the peptide anchor to the resin, okay? But th these examples are Solution phase, mixture, THF, methanol, mixture, and so on, pegylation, and so on, so on, okay? I'm going to talk about this special class of peptide pharmaceutical. This is an antibacterial, antibacterial and antifungal compound. The name of this is surfactin. This is mycosubtilin. okay? These are cyclic peptides containing a lipid tail. And as I told you before, one of the main topics of our group is the pegylation of making peptides more stable by pegylation or the lipidation. Okay. For example, those which are diabetics, you should know that this low release insulin is a is a lipidated version of insulin. Okay. It's a it's an insulin that because of the derivatization of the peptide, the metabolic uh, stability is, is is higher, and therefore the insulin remains in your body much longer than the typical insulin that is metabolically they did very, very fast, okay? That is why I teach one course of peptide pharmaceutical. That is why the purpose of pegylating and lipidating peptide, okay? Our idea was to make it simple to try to use multi-component reactions in macrocyclizations, okay? Macrocyclizations are easy to say, but not to do, because a macrocyclization is a reaction in which you need to connect two ends of a molecule. And here, entropy plays a crucial role because you have to use dilution Okay, because if you don't use diluted condition, what you get is an oligomerization or a polymerization because you are using bifunctional building blocks. So we set up, we took 
several years to set up conditions to do peptide macrocyclizations in solution, okay, because you have to use diluted conditions. The reactions on type, they take three, four days, up to one week. This is true. And the yields are not spectacular. If you see in one article 94% yield of a reaction, they are lying to you because macrocyclization reaction, if they are good, they reach 50-60% yield. Otherwise, you let it two months running the reaction because by kinetic is a slow reaction because it's diluted, okay? Most of the purpose of my talk is how we have adapted this macrocyclization to the solid phase to make it faster, okay? So this is one example in which we use the Passerini three-component reaction producing an aldehyde peptide, okay? Instead of the end terminal here, we introduce an aldehyde here and making a macrocyclization, take a look to the dilution, 25 nanomolar, concentration of the peptide, this is a high concentration. Sometimes we have to do it, one nanomolar concentration, okay? What we did, what we do, is not to use a huge pot of the reaction. We use what is called the pseudo-dilution conditions. So we use Syrosh pumps, which act very slowly, the, the reactants, to a solution of, the, of methanolic solution, for example, of the isocyanide, okay? And therefore, in that case, we have always a pseudo-diluted reaction, but the reaction because it's a slow addition with side pumps, the reaction takes two, three days to add very slowly the components, okay? But this is just to show one example as an introduction. We were able, because this Passerini three-component reaction, this is very nice, but we are generating a steriogenic center here, and this is a reaction with one-to-one, the -one, selectivity, so we have two peaks in the HPLC on the cyclic peptide. This is even very, very bioactive, okay? But this is it's not good to produce peptides with the, with the epimers, okay? Of the, that is now used in Cuba and in Germany to isolate membrane proteins because this is biosurfactant. It's antibacterial, okay? But it, his main application is to uh, extract proteins from the membrane. Sometimes you have to use high concentration of surfactants to isolate membrane proteins because they are anchored to the phospholipid bilayer uh, membrane and therefore you need surfactants. And this use, this is a spectacular for this. this is a simple, we produce the peptide in, in a solid phase robot and then we mix it with the isocyanide on the diluted conditions with the paraformaldehyde and then we obtain this in a normal decent yield. Don't expect something larger, okay? But we do only one purification step at the end, and this is very, very important, okay? What I want to talk today, uh, to talk about is how we are using a macrocyclization, multi-component macrocyclization to make mimetics of, of uh, protein epitopes, okay? Sometimes when you have a protein, and here this is the fight between the chemist and the biologist, what the molecular biologist will tell you that you have to express the protein by recombinant means and you have to use the whole proteins. But we, the chemists, we know that sometimes the biological activity of this protein is not because of the entire protein, it's because of this section of this fragment of the protein which has this conformation and which interacts, for example, with another protein. So these are, we are now entering to the field of protein-protein interactions. The interaction between one protein with another can be mimicked or can be reproduced or can be inhibited if you are using a cyclic peptide which is able to fold or to have the three-dimensional conformation of this epitope of the protein. This is in protein structure what is called a beta harping or a anti-parallel beta sheet, okay, because the reaction, the sequence, peptide sequence come here, and, but this is the active, the active site of the protein, okay? So by many years, chemists, synthetic chemists, they have been producing cyclic peptide capable to reproduce the same biological effect of the protein. Therefore, you don't have to reproduce the protein in E. coli or something like that. I'm going to show you what we are doing about this, okay? So nature does the same using the disulfide bridge because if you want to fix the conformation of a small peptide, you have to macrocyclize the peptide. If you have the open version of the peptide, what you will have is a very flexible peptide, mostly unless you have a huge protein, but medium-sized peptide, you have a very flexible peptide with no fixed conformation. Nature uses disulfide bonds. Oxytocins, we have many hormones in our body, which are, they contain disulfide bridge, okay, to make a stable a conformation of the peptide. Synthetic chemists, they have used lactamization, click chemistry, alkene methotesis, everything, for example, to make 
to take a normal peptide and to make a very stable helical structure. And this is in the field of a staple peptide that was a revolution 20 years ago. Everybody knows about that, okay? As we knew a lot from peptide chemistry and from multi-component reaction, we realized that we can modify this type of coupling approach that was made by normal lactamization chemistry to do it by oil chemistry. And we could take a normal non-helical peptide and make it helical, so we have to stabilize an helical conformation into a small peptide, and at the same time, functionalize it. With what? With everything that we have been done before. So we can make an helical peptide with a fluorescent label attached to it to see where it's going inside our cells, okay? We can functionalize and macrocyclize in one application. So we publish a chemical reviews about this technology, everything about our group two years ago now. You can take a look, okay? But let me show you how we did it. So with the peptide, we relieve on the resin, we do orthogonal chemistry, we deprotect these two functional groups, and then we add the isocyanide and the paraformaldehyde. We close the cycle here, and we don't have to use pseudo dilution condition. What we use is a resin with a very low loading. If you have read or learned something about peptide chemistry, you see that the resin of the loading is like the millimoles that you are using. This is like the equivalent that you are using, okay? So we can close this without using this. This reaction take place in, in one day overall. You grow the peptide, you do the reaction, and then you release the peptide from the resin using acidic conditions with water and so on. So we can make a stable helical peptides having lipids, sugars, whatever we want in one part of the helical. And I am showing this wheel format of the helix because here this is very important for the design because we are using this for the design of anti of antimicrobial peptides. As I mentioned yesterday, two days ago, I am leading a one global health center in Cuba for training Latin American students to develop vaccines and antimicrobials compounds, okay? So we, in our focus is the synthesis of peptides that can bind to bacterial membranes and therefore the bacteria cannot elicit, cannot develop resistance to them, okay? Because all classes of antibiotic now Bacteria have been shown the capacity to develop resistance, okay? So we are making this type of amphiphilic peptide. When you take a look to this, this tryptophan here is not placed in this position by luck. It's by design because we want to make this helical stable and this cationic charge of the lysines, they interact by cation P stacking with the, with the tryptophanes, okay? And they make the helical stable. And this lipid here provides a lipophilic tail with the cationic charge here that makes this type of helical compounds amphiphilic. So they interact with the membrane, they produce the lysis of the membranes, and they kill bacteria and fungi on this structure, okay? We can put many things, lipids longer, shorter, for the cationic charge, pegs, whatever. And this is the circular dichroemis study of the peptides showing, perhaps you are not a specialist, but this cotton, positive cotton effect here and the negative at these two positions unequivocally, they prove that we have an helical structure for this compound. So these compounds are helical, okay? In our article, we do a lot of NMR structure of the peptides. We make molecular modeling. We show the three-dimensional structure, but I don't have time to show. And for those who asked yesterday, this is a typical HPLC profile of one of these peptides. So take a look at that. So this is about 80% this is the main peak of peptide, okay? We just have to purify by reverse phase HPLC, the peptide, because these peptides are very polar. Even with the lipidic tail, they are very polar, so we have some byproducts here that now we know what they are. They are derived from the coupling. The coupling is one side product of this reaction, but we have a main, a very clean, for peptide chemistry, this is a very clean chromatograph, believe me, and we have all the technology to produce on the resin the staple peptide. So we grow the peptide, we deprotect, we microcyclize and functionalize at the same time, and then we release the peptide and do only one purification step. In Cuba, when we don't have too so much solvent, this is very relevant, to not to waste solvent and to do less chromatography purification, okay? We also have an example in which we grow the peptide, we make one macrocycle, then we continue to grow and we make a second macrocycle, and then we can introduce two different types of functionality. For example, this MBD a fluorescent label and a sugar in two different staples of the peptides, okay? Why we did so? Because 
it is known, so take a look to this one also, we introduced three cationic charge on the opposite phase of the lipidic peptide. This peptide is spectacularly cytolytic, okay? The problem that it has is that it is also hemolytic. So it also produces the lysis of our erythrocytes. So we cannot be using antibacterial. We are trying to sell it as a as a skin antimicrobial or something because it really kills kills bacteria very well but it also you cannot put it into your blood because it kills you the the erythrocyte as well but take a look to the design we are placing two lipidic tails on the opposite places on the opposite phase where the positive charge are okay for solubility issues sometimes we have to introduce a peg chain because this compound is very amphiphilic but it's also sometimes precipitate for micelles. It's difficult to work with that, okay? Why we are doing two types of macrocyclization, two consecutive macrocyclization, because it is known by a structural biologist that when you want to stabilize a very long helical structure with one lactam bridge, it's not enough. So this type of staple is not enough. You have to make one, two, or three, because this part of the peptide remains as a structure peptide so it is very flexible it does not have a very folded secondary structure so you have to introduce one two three to make a very long peptide so at some point we say what happens in instead of doing one or two i connect this position with this position could we do it by multi-component reaction and this is what we have been doing in the in the in the last in the last times so take a look the size of this peptide with all the other amino acids in a protective form but here we introduce, instead of a phenylalanine, we introduce this nitro, okay? This nitro uh, that participate, nitrophenols that participate in the ugly smile reaction. So we use a diisocyanide as the connector, as the linker of these two functionality, and we are able to produce, using pseudo dilution conditions, we are able to produce a very huge macrocycle. We are studying the secondary structure of this compound. It's still not reported. What it is already reported is the, the variant with the UGI chemistry, and we published that two years ago in Angevante because we were able to prove that this technology could be used to the development of, of anti-cancer mimetic of protein-protein interaction. We took a, a library of peptides with a sequence of one protein that is known as the P51 protein. It's, a, it's an inhibitor a checkpoint inhibitor in immunology. I'm not going to explain the biology of it. It's a very important type of protein which has an helical fragment that is the fragment that interacts with the other protein. So the idea from 20 years ago is to produce helical peptides that mimic the function of that P53 protein and activates the regulator. Connect very low diarboxylic and then produce a family of peptides this is the design of the design of the exception that is very in part structure and by the structure of protein is typically and so on. The chemist had been important to to make a bit long a very table Okay, but take a look to, for example, this in a polar with the with touch the people is the next break the important with the three in a medical touch. Another 
This is the reaction with Okay, count point two and two and primary amine or but that's a benefit of functionalized uh, uh, amines. Okay, what we took is that we develop a, a protocol in which we grow the peptide on the resin. We introduce a secondary amine here. Okay, and the license side chain. This is a very easy setup, and then we do the on resin protocol. Okay, on these solvents, take a look at we use a lot dichloromethane, trifluoroethanol, because of the solubility issue, because uh, methanol is not good for the swelling of the resin. Okay, and therefore we are able to introduce sugars, biotin, fluorescent label, uh, uh, fluorescent labels, polyethylene glycols in this one pot reaction. So when we release the peptide, we obtain this. Sugars, of course, these are pentoses and exoses because sugars. They have the cyclic amyacetal form, but they also react as carbonyl components, and they react very well in the petasis three component reaction. Okay, this is a very good reaction with boronic acids. When you take a look to the sigma aldrich catalyst, there are 1,000 boronic acids available that you can really introduce a lot of molecular diversity by labeling your peptides with any type of boronic acid. These are commercial available boronic acid that sigma aldrich sells. It was not that easy, and as I said, I always tell that it's easy, but it was not that easy. We had a lot of trouble. We started with the primary amine, but then we got double reactions, okay, by using formaldehyde and a normal boronic acid we have because the, the secondary amine that is formed reacts again in the petas, and even actually reacts better with the petasis than the primary amine, okay? But by using hydroxyacetone, take a look at this derived from hydroxyacetone. Hydroxyls are very relevant here. That's why we use sugar and hydroxyacetones because the hydroxyl coordinates the boronic acid and enhance the, the reaction rate of the petasis three component reaction, okay? So uh, glycerol, tetro, aldoses, and ketoses react very well in this reaction. And this was the first, the very first a example of the latest state multi-component labeling and macrocyclization of peptide using the petasis three component reaction. Let me skip this and this. I just wanted to highlight a little bit the, the yields and so on. We also did it for macrocyclization. Take a look that we introduced two different because at this point we were cooperating with Alexander Demlin on the he has the capacity to crystallize the proteins with the bound peptide and to assess. The, the inhibition rates of the protein-protein interaction. So we take di boronic acid with the phenyl and biphenyl groups, and we were able to produce a library of staple peptides, but they were not so biologically active, okay? Finally, and this is the final part, I want to talk a little bit about cancer. I want to introduce, to introduce you this natural family of natural compounds that is called tubulisins. They are called tubule lysins because they produce the lysins of the microtubules. The microtubules and spindles are part of the cytoskeleton of the cells, of our cells. So these are very potent, but very, very, very potent anti-cancer compounds. They have from nano to picomolar activity. That means that you can take one milligram, dissolve it in 10 milliliters, put it in a basket of water, and we all, all of us drink one drop and we die. That is what that means, epicomolar activity, when you have a cytotoxic compound. Extremely cytotoxic. Therefore, they cannot, be, they cannot be used per se as a cytotoxic in chemotherapy because they are too topic. And in cancer treatment, there is one specific issue that is called the therapeutic window, in which this is the, the concentration of the drug in which you have a therapeutic effect, but you don't kill the patient, okay? There is no toxicity associated. And you know very well that all cytotoxic compounds, taxol, the potylones, all the drugs that we use when we have cancer, they, are, they kill the cells during the mitosis. Most of them, not all of them, okay? But they kill the cells when the cells is dividing into identical cells, you know, process called mitosis. All of these compounds, they bind to the tubulins, to the tubulins which are these proteins that form the, the cytoskeleton, and they kill the cell during the division. And because cancer cells divide faster than the normal cells, that is why these cytotoxic compounds can be used in our body. Otherwise, they could be such a high toxicity. And that is why we lose the hair and we have vomits and diarrhea because the hair cells and the colon cells 
are those who divide faster because they need more regeneration, okay? And that's why the cancer patient, when they are suffering chemotherapy, they, they get bald and, and they have a lot of vomit or something. So the key for cancer treatment is not to find new compounds, is to find selective compounds, is to find compounds capable to kill selectively those cells that are cancer, cancerous, cancerigenous, and not the benign cells, okay? And for that, one of the strategies, I was going to give a full lecture about that, but I don't have time, is to conjugate this protein to monoclonal antibodies, because monoclonal antibodies has been devised to bind to a specific antigens or cell receptors which are overexpressed in cancer cells. So you use the monoclonal antibody as a directing device to deliver the cytotoxic compound inside the cancer cells and not in the normal cell. And this is the in a very simple explanation, the principle of antibody drug conjugates. But for antibody drug conjugates, you need cytotoxic compounds extremely potent because you are releasing one or two equivalents. One antibody is typically conjugated to two cytotoxic compounds, so you are releasing such a few amount of compound inside the cells that you need that that compound kill the cells. So it has to be very, very cytotoxic. And therefore, you need picomolar activity, okay? This is a peptide. This is a treta peptide, although you see it very complex, okay, produced by a containing non-proteinogenic, non-canonical amino acid. But the most relevant part of the peptide is this one, because this make this compound very metabolically unstable. So in our body, this N aminal here decomposes, okay, because you see we chemically know that this this is very labile, okay? So this is, despite the very high activity, this family of compounds that was described or discovered 20 years ago, never reached the development of antibody uh, drug conjugates. We are solving that situation, okay? What the people have done is that they, these are all the groups which have worked with this. They have reduced the size of this, okay? They have put methyl, ethyl, and propyl groups at this position. You lose some part of the biological activity, but the compound is so potent that even losing one thing of the, of the uh, bio, they continue to be highly cytotoxic, okay? And these are the positions where they have conjugated, so they have introduced an amine here by the carboxylic acid, by the tertiary amine, or by the Nicolau introduced this alcohol here to introduce any type of functionality to introduce a linker a bioconjugation linker that can be used for conjugation to a monoclonal antibody, okay? To use, to develop the antibody drug conjugates, okay? In 2011, my friend Ludger Bessiohan, he used the UGI reaction for the development of the most stable and most bioactive synthetic analogs of tubulicins. They are called tubuugis. You can look at the paper of 2011. It's full of Cubans. They were my students, but I was not uh, cooperating with him at that time, okay? But what is the problem? Take a look here. Take a look to this structure, okay, with an aliphatic chain here that could be three, four carbon atoms, and take a look to this one. It's very similar also with an aliphatic chain here that can be of the same nature. So, well, so we don't need to reduce this part that enhance the, the biological activity. And therefore, he produced these compounds. Take a look to the biological activity in colon and, and pancreatic cancer cells is almost picomolar, it's sub-micromolar, sub-nanomolar activity. They are extremely potent, okay? They keep the, but the proline, take a look that this is an UG4 component reaction between this fragment and this dipeptide. Solution phase, uh, take a look to the gel. The gel is very, very, very low, okay? Only 30% gel, around 30%. They try for 10 years to scale up and to improve this process, but they obtain this byproduct that is the main product that is obtained. So they are not able to scale up the synthesis of this, and therefore they are not able to sell it to the industry because the industry does not want one compound that is very difficult to produce. So despite stability and very potent anti-cancer activity, they have not been using to sell it, okay? But several years ago, we developed this strategy to do the UGI reaction on solid phase. And the strategy is very simple. We take the, the resin, and we introduce the imine here with the isocyanide and the carboxylic acid with the FMOC protein. So we introduce the same like in a peptide coupling. This is like a peptide coupling, but through an UGI reaction. And then we continue growing the peptide after that. Okay? So this is the only 
you, take a, you can take a look to the papers. This is the only method known in literature that allows the C-terminal functionalization of peptide on resin, and we can do it only by multi-component reaction, but it's not the topic of today, okay? Because most important to that is that we can, we prove, and these are all the articles here, that we can grow the peptide and to do an intermediate UGI reaction, introducing this FMOC amino acid with the protected side chain, and then continue growing the peptide. So we can replace a secondary amide here, but a tertiary amide, introducing, for example, a lipid, a fluorescent label, as I told you, whatever we want, because we can produce isocyanide. We try not to use the small one because they are very, they have very bad odors, as you know, okay? For example, this is an antibacterial peptide that was discovered here in Russia in the 40s, I think, and the name is Gramicidin S. So it has a spectacular antibacterial activity, but it's also hemolytic, and that is why it's not a commercial drug, although in Japan it is used as a commercial drug. So we have a huge program trying to replace this proline here. Just take a look here. This is a tertiary amide. Proline is the only amino acid that contains a tertiary amide. So we have to rely a lot on a structural biology to understand why proline is very important in protein structure, because proline typically occurs and appears in torn inducing fragments of the protein. So when the protein chain comes and it has to be reversed, the directionality, proline and glycines are typically there, okay? In gramicidine, we have a proline with a D amino acid here. So we produce analogs of gramicidine now in our program, I'm not going to talk about the synthesis is described, but not the biological evaluation, okay? In which we have replaced the proline by this tertiary amino acid that mimics, it has the same a structural effect because it's also tertiary amide here and here. But proline is not functionalized, and we can introduce here lipids to enhance the affinity towards the phospholipid membrane of fluorescent labels or polyethylene glycol to make the peptide more stable, everything that I told you yesterday and today, okay? But today I want to talk about tubulizing and cancer. So we proved that we could, in the middle of the synthesis, we could introduce an OGI4 component reaction. So this is the synthesis that we develop. We modify the resin. We introduce the first amino acid. This is a lot of solid phase peptide synthesis. If you are not into the field, you don't realize the novelty of this part because this is very, it doesn't look so interesting, but it's very important for the people who, who know. Typically, let me tell you, explain you, typically you use four equivalents of all the amino acid to do the coupling. Okay, because you need to run the reaction to completion because you are doing so many reactions that if you are losing 5% in each of them, at the end you get nothing. So you use four equivalents. You use this Nini Dream test to ensure that the coupling was successful and was 100%. Okay, and therefore these building blocks, these Ugi building, these uh, tubulizing building blocks are very expensive. We have spent a lot of, not we, but the students have spent a lot of time doing that. So we developed this method to use only almost one equivalent because this is a diazo resin activated that reacts quantitatively with the carboxylic acid to form the ester, okay? This is the inside. But we grow here. Once we have this, we do the on-resin UGI reaction introducing this N-alkylation fragment here. Everything that is in red is derived from the UGI-4 component reaction. And introducing here isoleucine. We continue introducing the peptide. Then we grow the resin, the peptide on the resin, no purification step so far, okay? Then we, we knew at some point doing biological activities that this ester functionality, this acetate is relief, is cleaved by, by ester acids inside our body, so the compound loses a lot of the biological activity because of metabolic degradation. So some people, it was not our idea, introduced this propyl moiety here and they found that the activity remains. So therefore, we were able to produce the tubuugi that were produced 10 years ago, but without any problematic. So with the reaction, most of the reaction are 100%. We are obtaining about 30% of overall gene after 47 reactions, okay? After 47 reactions with only one purification step at the end. And take a look to the biological activity. Very good cytotoxicity. This is the tubuugi that was reported in JAX 2000, uh, 2011. This is our new compound. We keep the same type of biological activity producing this compound by solid phase. But the relevant here is the diversity that we can introduce by the simple UGI reaction because this is an aliphatic 
isocyanide. Okay, I take a look to all the isocyanide that we use. One of the advantages of solid phase peptide synthesis is that you grow the peptide, and then you just you do what is called in combinatorial chemistry the split and pull of the combinatorial library. You can divide the resins. We do one gram of the resin. We grow the peptide until one position, and then we wait one ten of this, and then we do one hundred and then we do 100 reactions different, but, and then we continue doing the final steps, okay? This is one of the, you split the amount of the compound that you have. You don't have to do 100 reaction in 100 balloons and so on and so on. This is the advantage of solid phase peptides. We introduce alcohols, amines, everything. I have to say that in some cases, the biological activity was significantly dropped, but in some others, we had a very good biological activity. For example, introducing lipids, take a look here, the size of the lipid enhanced the biological activity of this bioactive compound, enhances internalization. So the compound is better internalized because it's more hydrophobic, and you know because of these lipinky rules, all the effect of hydrophobicity on the cell permeation capacity of the drugs, and so on and so on. But the most important is this one, Again, these are the positions that have been used for conjugation. We, and we are reporting this year this, this paper in cooperation with our German partners that we introduce a new conjugation site. So not by here, not by here, not by, by the previous position. So we are able to patent something because we were the first that said that we can also conjugate it to boogie by here because we can introduce it. And this thiol can be used for conjugation to antibodies. I could uh, explain you how is the technology of, of antibody modification and so on, but in principle, you reduce the disulfide of the antibodies, opening the disulfide bridge, releasing, uh, forming primary thiols that react with everything that you put in here. So there is an activation reagent here, but you have to form, the, to open the disulfide that join the heavy change to the light chain here, and then we conjugate this. As, so we are in the presence of a new generation of antibody drug conjugates. Take a look to the biological activity. You don't see anything, and I don't see it. There. Sorry for this. Well, you have to believe me at this stage that the, the antibody drug conjugate is highly selective. Here it's not so important that you keep the subnanomolar activity, but that you reach selectivity. Those cancer cells, like the lung and the breast uh, cancer cells, which overexpress the receptors, then the antibody binds to them, internalizes, and release, because this disulfide bond and these methyls are very important, release the payload inside the cells because inside our cells, we have one endogenous peptide that is called glutathione that has a free thiol and this free thiol really opens a disulfide bridge. So this is a, a antibody drug conjugate totally designed to be internal, to internalize and to release the cytotoxic drug inside cytotoxic cells and not in every cell. So we are not injecting the patient we are now in ongoing in vivo study with mice. This takes 10, 15 years to be developed, but this is an in vitro activity in which we prove the selectivity. And, and I want to highlight this article in Nature Biotechnology because this, we use antibodies producing Cuba. So Cuba has the only factor in Latin America that is capable to produce monoclonal antibodies for a variety of concepts, okay? For a variety of immunotherapeutic applications. This was highlighted in this Nature Biotechnology actually talking about how good is the biotech sector in Cuba. That was, I was very impressed when I talk about this, okay? But our part is more the chemistry, how we produce the cytotoxic compounds. I have to say that the antibody modification, we see that antibody are huge molecule, but they are not difficult to, to derivatize and the students can do it very, very easily. Here the important is not the antibody, but the linker technology and the cytotoxicity of the compounds, how stable you make this. Take a look that we also did it without the methyl groups and the compound get released on the blood. So, because in our cell, also there are, we have albumin that also have free thiols and we also have glutathione, but at very low concentration. So if you don't protect aesthetically this disulfide bridge here, you, when, when you get injected the antibody drug conjugates, you are releasing off target the cytotoxic compound. So you are killing yourself and the cytotoxicity is very high. That's why we have to study in mice previously what is the, the metabolic stability, the circulation life and everything for the antibody drug conjugates. With that, 
I want to finish because I have talked too much about today. The TeraCycle part was not part of my intention, so I want to thank my students at the University of Havana, to my cooperation in Germany and Brazil. Most of the TeraCycle chemistry was done in Brazil because the I have to say the organocatalytic experts were in Brazil. Sometimes that's why I don't know all the details about the organocatalysis. While the multi-component part was was in Cuba, we cooperate. And this is the student Janira Mendes. She got the the Bayer Prize being in Cuba. And this is very relevant. She got the the annual prize for the PhD thesis because she developed all the multi-component technology to produce vaccines and antibody drug conjugates. So I'm very proud that she doing a, a job there was uh, awarded by an international pharmaceutical company. To you again, thank you very much. I know I talk too much, but I hope you like it at some point. Questions? Thank you very much. Anything, if I don't know, I will say I don't know. I will I will not lie you to you, <laughs> okay? Well, I choose peptide. I can say this here, because in Cuba they don't give money to anything that is not related to biomedical applications. This is true. So the only science priority in Cuba is medicine, or either you work doing something that has some potential to become a drug, or a biopharmaceutical product, or you receive no one cent. This is the reality. So when I finish my PhD, you can do all the science that you want, publish nature, paper, whatever, but they will, they will not fund you because it's a poor country with the limited resources and they give money only to medic medical applications. And peptides have a lot of medical applications. So my intention was to develop all the chemistry that I wanted, but with peptides. And on the way to that, I found that every time, for example, you make a new reaction and we do it with a small scaffold with the ethyl, methyl groups, and the articles don't find it so interested. But when you do it with a bioactive peptide and you prove a potential applicability, the referees, the companies, everybody likes it more. And peptides, this is the future of, pep of therapeutics is peptide because peptides are in between a small molecule drugs and biologicals. Proteins are too huge, too expensive to produce. And peptides can be produced by solid phase peptide synthesis. So it's, you are able, if you develop a reaction, in solution phase, and you can adapt it to solid phase, so you can do it in an intermediate, intermediate process in the middle of your peptide synthesis, and then continue growing the peptide. And you make, for example, one approach now is to make hybrids of heterocycles with peptide, because peptides are metabolically degraded. Our body is made to kill peptides, to destroy peptides. When we eat proteins, we have, we have proteases that degrade all the peptides. So peptides are very bad therapeutics because of that, because when you have a bioactive peptide and you inject it in our blood, there is a cocktail of proteases destroying, and the half-life is two hours, four hours. Okay, so you have to protect the peptides by pegylation, lipidation, introducing non-canonical amino acids in the positions where the, for example, we have patents in which we take a bioactive peptide of an international company, but we know we studied that in the chemistry that trypsin, for example, trypsin caught the peptides in the basic residues, okay? So if you know that your peptide will be metabolic and stable there, you can make an UV reaction at that position and to convert the secondary amine to a tertiary. People do that just by introducing an N-methyl amino acid sometimes or a D-amino acid at that position. But the D-amino acid most likely will change the conformation of the peptide. So an UGI reaction in that position we have shown that enhance the metabolic stability of the peptide from hours to two days. And this is remarkable for the pharmaceutical company, okay? That's why I can say that I, I like peptides and application with peptides. But... You have to buy a robot. We do it manually, but nowadays, if you have money, you can buy a robot. And But we do it manually, and, and the students, one they learn, it's very easy. You can grow a peptide of 15 amino acids in two or three days. 
15 amino acids, and this is true. And then to do a reaction at the end terminal with amino group or something. Like Bad peptides have solubility issues, so they are not soluble in toluene or dichloromethane. You have to use DMF as solvent, DMSO, which is difficult to take out. Then you are, you need a different analytics because we have to buy a preparative HPLC, so on, so on. So it takes like 10 years to adapt. If you are young and you want to jump into peptide, do it now because it takes time to purchase the chemicals and, and the instrument. I suffered that. Questions? Well, in one case, we are on the way to that. So in Cuba, we have one, one inhibitor of one protein-protein interaction that is used for, for ovarian cancer. I don't know what is, it. what is it. That we produce a version that is more metabolically stable. It's not more active because the sequence already exists. We produce, and, and it's now in clinical trial phase two. But you have to know that one compound take from 10 to 20 years to go to the market. So don't believe on this, that I developed this and three years later was in the market. This is a... Yes, with back, no. Vaccine also take 10 to 15 years. In the case of COVID, there was an urgency, okay? And all the regulatory agencies knew that they, not, they had to speed up the approval processes. But in, in a normal way, that can take 10 to, Five to ten years. Eh? Who will help us? Ah, COVID helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, for example, we in the vaccine that we developed, we had been antibacterial vaccine with the same technology before. So the regulatory agencies, they don't like novelty. The patent office, they like novelty, but the regulatory agency, if you are able to prove that this one was used before and was marketed and two million people used that drug and nobody happened to them, they approve it easily. That's why the messenger RNA vaccines, they were approved so fast because of the urgency. Otherwise, they could have taken 10 years more to be approved by regulatory security, safety, you had to make clinical trial with million, not million, but a few hundred thousand people and wait for a long period to see if you, there are no secondary effects that sometimes appear after years and so on. But COVID, hurry up everything. <laughs> but with the anti-cancer, so I have to say that the anti-cancer also have priority because when you are dying, so it's not the same to make a vaccine for a children of one year that is a, a, a healthy individual or healthy children, okay? But if you are dying with cancer, and there is one, for example, the cancer patient, they enter in clinical trials very fast. Because if I am dying and say there is a new therapy that is being in hospital in QSA, I am in, I am in, because you know you will die in six months. So it doesn't matter about the toxicity. I will put you an example. This antibody drug, this antibody that we are using in the antibody drug conjugates produce rash. This is an anti-epidermial growth factor antibody. So this is lung cancer, lung cancer, it grows very high and needs a lot of epidermial growth factor because the lung cancer is an epithelial cancer, okay? So the cancer cells, the cancer lung cells, they overexpress the epidermial growth factor receptors. So this is an anti-monoclonal antibody that goes to the cancer cells and blocks the, blocks the receptor. Therefore, the epidermial growth factor cannot come and cannot interact with the cancer, and therefore the cancer dies. Uh, your healthy cells also died because you are blocking that interaction that is key for the epithelial cells to grow. But as I told you, the cancer cells, they divide and grow faster, they die cancer, okay? But you get rash, for example, because your skin also needs epith epidermial growth factor to produce skin cells. So you get like a rash and the patients, they complain. But when you have lung cancer and you go to the doctor and they tell you, you have one year of life, 
And then I tell you, you have rush, but five years in Cuba, there are patients living with five to 10 years with lung cancer with this antibody. So you can live 10 years with rash. What do you prefer, dying or having rash? So therefore, the cancer patients, they, they, the regulatory uh, concerns are not so strict like in, like in the case of vaccines for health individuals, because this is something that the people really need. You cannot delay the treatment 10, 15 years seeking or for secondary effects when there are people dying for that. But this is cancer, okay? Other diseases is not the case. Okay, thank you very much. Then tomorrow we are going to talk about metal catalysis, not only about my work, but about the work of others also, if you like to come.